Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, Ignacio. Which governance to improve care production quality? Well, first of all, let's try to understand the question. And perhaps uh, within a few minutes, you will, able, able, you will be able to explain to us how it works, what are the definitions, how you can organize governments, what is uh, care production, what are the indicators, who does what? You have five minutes. Quality is defined as the capacity of a care or health service to raise the probability of a positive outcome for the patient and for the population. So it's about improving the quality of the work given by the health professionals, but you also have to pay attention to the quality of care throughout the entire chain or system. And it's about raising the probability of a positive result. We know that good quality care cannot succeed all the time. You have some elements of incertitude. Still, we expect, expect that the care provided brings a more advantages than disadvantages. So the care should be useful. There are five dimensions taken into account now. Quality of care is multidimensional. You have to simultaneously pay attention to all dimensions. First of all, efficiency, very obviously. That's uh, the obvious expectation. You need uh, the care to produce some effects and to be given to the right persons. Secondly, accessibility. A care that uh, takes place too late, that's not good. Uh, accessibility, patient's experience and reactivity of health system. And this is not a detail. Care quality is not a technical notion. It's about the, the patient's experience and that a patient's experience must be taken into account to determine the quality of care. I, I'm interrupting you because we have a slide here about the criteria, what, which is the most important criteria to evaluate the quality of the work of a, med, of a doctor. And Medical criteria have been quoted in 51% of cases. Relationship with the doctor, 35%, and quality of life, 14%. So it's interesting to refer to that survey. Absolutely. It's not always obvious for everyone that patient's experience is that significant. I would like to add another dimension, that of efficiency. We want to improve care quality at the systematic, at the systemic level, as well as within health establishments. It is very important to be able to say that we use the available resources in the most efficient way. So when we talk about governance of quality, first of all, we have to measure quality through indicators, if the indicators which we use are aimed at the doctor and at the patient, it's not for the health authorities. So we have to define indicators, but in, in a meaningful way for patients as well as for doctors, for health professionals. We can quote the mortality rate after a certain delay, 30 days, 90 days, or the rate of readmission, for instance. These are such indicators. Besides indicators, we need to support professionals and patients because both categories are going to contribute to the, the improvement of health quality. We also have to uh, plan some financial uh, support. 
as necessary. No. In the High Authority of Health, we are fully aware of this, uh, these issues. I've been said that a, a British surgeon receives every week or month a dashboard of indicators, uh, performance, uh, uh, nosocomial infections. These indicators exist in France, and you have them, you use them. But as Mrs. Arnold said just now, why can't we use them directly in the field right now? That's the role of the HAS. Thank you for giving me a chance to explain about what exists in France at present. We don't have everything, but we use many of these tools. Let's see how we can improve. Uh, first of all, I like the way you are presenting indicators. They are a tool, a tool in the hands of health professionals mainly, in an approach for quality enhancement. Secondly, what do we have in France? We have many indicators by establishments. So it is centered on health establishments, private or public. But we have such indicators. For a long time, these were process indicators. The information com came from uh, patients' files and they were used. Uh, they are integrated as of now in uh, uh, funding processes, for instance. The medical time is precious, so now we want to identify in our medical and administrative uh, databases some indicators that make sense. It happens already. All health establishments receive their rate of complications after uh, knee or, or hip surgery. This this appears by establishment, not by individual, by for any individual surgeon. Why is that? Why is, does it stop at that level? Well, because we don't uh, have the information on activities by individual professionals. So it exists on the basis of the PMSI. Some others are being tested, for instance, specific mortality 30 days after an infarctus or post-surgery mortality. I would like to bring your attention on how difficult it's difficult to have appropriate indicators. If they are meaningless, it is counterproductive, professionals will say. What is that rubbish? So if they have to be meaningful, we have really to make sure that they can bring some improvement and we have to uh, stick to reality. They should have a positive predictive value with respect to what is in the files. So we've got to be very careful about quality and that requires time and methodology. Now, secondly, and I also agree with what you're saying about indicators for patients, we've got many things in France. We've got lots of patient experience for patients who are in hospital for over 48 year, eight hours. We've got some global scores that have been put together, which are entirely um, in the public domain and transparent. Uh, so whether we're talking about teams or hospitals, uh, we've got these indicators. It, in 2019, we got 1.2 uh, million patients in France in hospitals, uh, for example, in 2019. There's a step further we, we need to move towards, and that is clinical results of patients. All of the literature internationally show us that this is beneficial for the quality of health. But then there's variability. We've got to uh, build a questionnaire for each specific clinical context, and then it has to be rolled out. Are we talking about national indicators, or should we be talking about team-based uh, local indicators uh, or surveys? So now, I agree with you. We don't have enough tools yet to be able to give each practitioner these indicators. Yes, that's true. Let's see what's happening at establishment level, at hospital level. You represent uh, the conference of uh, general managers of hospitals. So we'll ask you uh, about what you think, but not just with respect to hospitals. But the question is, given all of the this information, given these indicators, 
How do we move on to a managerial level? How can quality become the concern of people in charge of wards and hospitals? Now, there are two questions, if you like. We are reading that hospitals are in a situation of social and health care crisis. So quality is still a priority in such conditions? I'll start by answering the second question, if that's okay. Yes, there's a lot of media coverage of these subjects, especially given the crisis uh, hitting emergency wards, but then there are other subjects res with respect to retirement homes, nursing homes. Yes, there, there are health crises. There are crises in terms of uh, hospital populations, uh, professionals. There are specific uh, characteristics uh, with respect to emergency services. But I think basically, uh, we're often, we often talk about who arrives late, who arrives early. It's the same for the healthcare system. If we look at opinion surveys, and I agree with what has been said, there's mistrust with respect to the deterioration in the quality of health care. French people have very good health care, even if we have to make progress in terms of quality and improve the overall quality of the system itself. But I think that uh, when we look at the crisis situation and the social and financial and health care tensions, we've got to be relative about things in terms of quality and the management of our patients and the role of university hospitals, uh, the role of innovation research, uh, uh, so that we can move towards more quality and better treatment. There's technological progress as well and continuous improvement of management of quality of health care uh, in our teams. It's a very important point. Uh, it's, very, it's important uh, for the professionals on a day-to-day -day basis. It's an essential point. Now, let's go back to quality indicators and managerial policies and quality in hospitals especially university hospitals. Obviously, these challenges are an integral part of uh, managerial policies, uh, strategic uh, policies, medical projects, uh, wards, uh, centers, uh, establishments, uh, area-wide projects as well. If we want to exceed, uh, go, get beyond this silo-based uh, approach, uh, we need to, to look at the entire patient's pathway and talk about indicators uh, relating to that pathway. Wards have a certain number of indicators. We know how to measure uh, activity according to doctors, according to hospitals. However, it's not uh, something done as a matter of routine. There are indicators according to centers, uh, and, and we need more medical results indicators. If we take the rate of mortality, for example, let's take uh, the ca a cardiac ward in Ren Hospital, the mortality rate is followed by the teams, the cardiac surgery teams. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. So there's a national base, a European base, uh, so that they can compare how they are doing to the rest of uh, the country and uh, Europe. So mortality rates make no mean have no meaning if we don't uh, have something to compare against. So the type of patient to manage, the age of the patient, the characteristics of the patient, a, a mortality rate without all of that doesn't mean anything, whether it's going up or going down. So we've got to be relative. We've got to be careful about the use of these in indicators. We've got to look at medical results. We've got to trust uh, people. We've got to trust the, the people uh, in the field, the teams in the field, and we've also got to have decentralized indicators as well. If in Rennes, we've set up a, a carte blanche uh, project per ward. So we've got our policies for certification uh, for in terms of healthcare. But we've said to the wards, tell us what your five priorities are in terms of quality. And I'll take uh, the infectious disease award. They came up with some objectives, and they are not really the objectives that we had thought of. So this equality approach has to be brought in to by people who are directly involved. We've got to co-build things with teams, with the medical teams and the users and the patients. Uh, you know, the ward said it's at night. Patients are complaining that they can't sleep at night. This is something uh, that we hear about all the time. So how do we improve the quality uh, of lives at night time? So you, you, you need these, this kind of approach. Now, let's uh, 
It's, so you need to talk with the teams. So how can all of this be brought together? I think both are important. We need to build things with professionals and patients. We, we shouldn't just be inventing things in our own little corner. So what's important is that in a team, professionals need to uh, compare what they're doing, the consumption of blood bags, uh, you know, they need to do this locally. Both approaches are compatible and consistent. We have to have local approaches within wards with their specifics, uh, and, and we need to make progress. We need to have more transparency. Um, we need to work with uh, scholarly societies. We need to communicate results. We need to take the right precautions. And that's not incompatible with an area-based or an establishment-based approach. I think both approaches are complementary. It depends what we want to do as well. For the team, because many things are based on the shoulders of teams, it's essential that there is a, a, a specific use and building of indicators. What we want in certifications to focus especially on this quality approach. Indicators are also useful for patients. So if they want to choose a hospital, they're useful for regulators, for authorizations of financing. And they have other qualities. They have to be national. Yes, we'll try and come back to that. Performance and financing. But before, Inesio, you represent the Spanish system, which is very different from ours. So, as we've already heard, these results indicators uh, are, can be excellent. Your Italian colleague was saying that you're second. This Spanish system, then, it's mysterious for us because it's an, there's an NHS system and then there's the, a parallel system. What about the governance? How is it operated? How is it how is it organized? Explain how it works in your country because you've got some great results. Before starting, thank you very much for having yeah, me here. Yeah, yeah, I'm Guy. Uh, 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 we, we appear very good in the, in the, at the rankings, but the truth is that do, we don't have in Spain a national system of control of, of quality in healthcare. This is this. This, this is the truth. The, the description that has been made this morning by Francois Grosset mm -hmm. about the, 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 the quality is, is controlled by the regions, mm -hmm. the, the autonomous communities, uh, so that create a kind of imbalances and inequalities is totally, totally exact. It's, 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 it's a perfect description. The health ministry has developed uh, some lines of improvement that have uh, an orientational character. Mm -hmm. Uh, among them the commitment about not to do in, in collaboration with the scientific societies. But uh, there doesn't exist a system, uh, a systematic evaluation about the degree of implementation and effectiveness of these recommendations. Having said that, uh, the, the regions, we have 17 regions in Spain, autonomous communities, uh, does control the, the quality in the region. Mm -hmm. but each of them with different indicators. Mm. Some of them, for example, uh, Catalonia, mm. uh, uh, Madrid or Murcia, and started to publish in, in, in some observatories uh, the indicators. But uh, what we don't have is uh, an integrated system of uh, indicators for the entire national health system. And due to the relative small size of our, of our region, because we have 17, it's difficult sometimes to compare the, the results of the different institutions, the different uh, hospitals, and so on. Obviously, the, the hospitals uh, have also their own system of quality, but this is a different thing. Uh, and the, the, the reason for that, the reason for not having, in my opinion, a national system of quality control in healthcare is because the Spanish health system has been, in the last years, extremely reluctant to reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some bodies, for example, FACME, representing the scientific societies, that are asking for years for a body to control 
the, 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 the quality in the entire health system. But and they even propose a set of standards, but uh, with uh, unsuccessful, unsuccessfully uh, so far. Well, uh, why does Spain have a system so reluctant to reforms? In my opinion, for two reasons. First, because Spain has a system totally decentralized, and this, this decentralization has been, has been made before defining a system of governance for the entire system. And this is a problem. And sometimes there are political fights between the regions and the, and the central government about the different competences. Well, that's the first reason. And the second reason is precisely the rankings. We appear so good in the rankings, but politicians say, if everything is so good, uh, why, why take the, the, the risk and the cost of introducing reforms? <laughs> um, but the, the value of the rankings, uh, we have to debate a little about that. For example, take the, 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 the ranking of Bloomberg. In the last uh, rank about, about efficiency, uh, the last um, ranking of Bloomberg, it defines Spain as the, as the, the most efficient, e efficient system in Europe and the third in the world. Well, uh, uh, the, 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 in, in the previous report, we were in position 14. What, why this change? Well, it's, it's interesting. They, they consider only two things, nothing related to experience of patients and these kind of things, no. Only life expectancy and the cost per capita. Mm. What happened between the, 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 the first and the second report of Bloomberg, the economic crisis? In Spain, we had a deep economic crisis. The public expenses in healthcare has been reduced between 2009 and 2013 by 12%. No wonder we are now much more efficient if we measure only life expectancy and cost per capita. But, uh, and this is, this is my explanation. So, uh, maybe the most demanding reform, there are, there are a lot of reform demanding in Spain, but maybe the most demanding reform is the creation of a body to monitor quality in the entire national health system. Très bien. La première leçon qu'on peut tirer, c'est méfions-nous des, des rankings. Méfions-nous des indicateurs globaux, en effet, mais ça. Global indicators, yes. Now let's talk about two subjects. Just so that we move out of the hospital context, let's talk about relevance. I'd like to hear you talk about relevance. Relevance, maybe we do too many things, too many acts are carried out. Perhaps some are dangerous. And perhaps this is, needs to be linked to the second subject, which is the healthcare path. It's already difficult to manage this at hospital level. How can we? Uh, manage it for chronic uh, diseases. I don't know how you you do this or are going to do this in the future. So, can we have an introduction to this subject, an academic introduction? I'll start with the healthcare path. The, the difficulty of the healthcare path is uh, the difficulty of defining indicators or measurements. Why are we interested in the path, in the healthcare path? because it reflects uh, the experience of people, not just in hospitals, but all, not just with GPs, but in the overall healthcare system. So there are indicators, therefore. Now, the patient, when we talk about patient experience, the patient does not actually exist. There are patients who suffer from diabetes, patients who have breast cancer, patients who suffer from various things. There are pregnant women who also follow a healthcare path. So this is what we're seeing elsewhere as well. The indicators of, have multiplied over the last 10 years concerning the healthcare path because we're increasingly attentive to the experience of patients. And these indicators are very specific. There are experience surveys organized. And I'm very happy that in France we've started to see experience, patient experience indicators for hospitals. But that's not enough. If we want to improve practices, we need more specific indicators. Indicators based on the experience of women with breast cancer, for example, or who uh, are pregnant or who suffer from diabetes. I'd also like to underline something else that's important. In France, we've got a global policy 
that means that we um, count a lot on data, administrative data in databases. We need patient surveys more than anything. In Europe, France is one of the countries, one of the rare countries, where we don't have systematic patient surveys focusing on different groups of patients. So the authority, the health authority, two subjects. Uh, how are you going to go about the future? And in terms of patient surveys, do you have a role to play? Now, in terms of uh, longitudinal studies with the CNAM, well, the CNAM entrusted us with the building of uh, indicators and paths. Why? Because that's where things are not going very well for patients and system users. They don't know where they're going, and there's, there are these terrible silos between cities and hospitals, uh, healthcare services. It's all so complex that they don't know where to go or where to turn to. So it's based on this patient need that they were, we're currently building guides. Uh, it's professionals who are building them, who we provide a methodological expertise, and the idea is to bring everybody around the table. And there are a lot of people involved, the cities, professionals, hospitals, patients. So that's a lot of people to bring together. And I think that it really is a great tool for breaking down the silos. We need to get rid of what is the worst experience for patients, what has to be improved needs to be focused on. We need to give professionals compasses and regulators measurement means. So we've got to work with the CNAM and the CNP, so professional organizations according to speciality. That's what the CNP is in France. So we've decided to work on 13 paths that are emblematic because the challenges are huge, because of the pathologies, because of the populations like elderly people or disabled people. And we're, we are currently building guides, uh, drawing up the guides for these paths, and then we need to find the right indicator so that we know what to improve. That's just one step, however. After that, we need to work at regional level, the regional health authorities, the professionals, and different organizations that uh, we have in cities, hospitals. Uh, they all need to buy into these indicators. That's a good question, and I was going to hand over the floor to you. When we talk about the regional level, you've got your, the university hospital, of course, uh, the, the, the regional university ho hospital. Now we've got the GHTs, uh, and the university hospital will be playing a bigger role, which is quite frightening. Uh, the mayor of Samurai Hill explained to us the limits of this system. And then there are the independent professionals. So this question of governance that is really quite present. But coming back to quality specifically, how how do you think how do you think we can implement what has been designed by the high health authority? You know, concretely close to patients and close to uh, hospital teams and city teams. It's not easy. Well, of course, there are government governance challenges here, but we can be very concrete. And I know that there are a lot of people working on these indicators, but meanwhile, we can make progress on what would be the relevant indicators. Let me come back to this question of the relevancy of the indicator. And so with something that would be quite simple, we could use this method of patient tracers where we have in our groups of hospitals, the university hospitals grouped together with other hospitals. We're working also with retirement homes and medical and social staff to define maybe about 15 patient tracer studies and study the patient path and where were the interruptions and then define the indicators that we think would be relevant to evaluate the quality of the treatment of each patient. And this would be managed by the professionals. And that would be very concrete, because if you look at the patient's uh, file, it wouldn't be generalized to all patients. But uh, because the basic topic is really, there's one major element that slows down the use of these quality indicators at the scale of a territory, whether it's the city, the hospital, private or public, is the question of information systems. We talked a lot this morning about this, and it's correct. Today, we have a real complex machinery. Uh, and so if we want to deploy massively these indicators to uh, 
analyze the patient's uh, healthcare path, we need to communicate. We need these systems to be able to communicate with each other. There's not even a secure messaging system yet. So on all of these topics, the information systems and the digital tools, obviously, it's linked to the patient's files. They're all different between the hospitals. If we don't massively invest in IT, and we're doing this in Wren and in Brittany, I think we're quite ahead of others on the topic, but we will never succeed in carrying out all the assessments that we want to on the quality and on the treatment path, and we'll have a real defect in terms of a lack of information. Or we'll have to ask people to fill out these dashboards, and that will take a lot of time. So this is a real challenge. I think that's a real major lever of change. Well, if we look at the regionalized nature of the Spanish system, perhaps that could give us a solution. Despite what you said earlier, Ignacio, you have private organizations in which the policyholders the, uh, have private health care, and then you have the public system. In certain Spanish regions, the region has entrusted by delegation the management of the private sector to these public establishments. Did you define integrated quality indicators to do this? There are always these tricky questions of information systems. Can you share some experience with us on this topic, or maybe not? Complicated system. Uh, Twenty percent of our population has a premium. All of them are covered by the public system because this is compulsory, as you know. We have a universal system. But 20% of the population uh, buy a, a premium, premium, a private premium, which is something extraordinary in Europe. Uh, and, and, and these insurance companies give not only, uh, the, they don't cover the copayment as here in France, but on, also they give care with uh, uh, hospitals and uh, specialists and so on. Uh, and why are the reasons uh, for the people to having uh, been covered by, by the public system uh, of buying this uh, private insurance? Well, there are a lot of surveys, and uh, uh, maybe the most important reason is accessibility. Because we have a serious problem of waiting lists in, in Spain. In Spain, we have, we have two things. Waiting lists, and waiting lists uh, in, in our classification are for uh, uh, hospitals, hospitalization, for uh, surgical intervention, special procedures, diagnostics and therapy, therapeutic, therapeutics, and, uh, 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 and, yeah, and for that. And the fact is that according to the, the public information, 12% of the population has to wait more than six months for a surgical intervention. And 37% more than 60 days, 60 days for a first visit. This is the situation in hospitals and specialists. And then we have delays. Delays, the morals in Spanish, is for primary care. And we define, define delays with people have to wait for more than 48 hours to be seen by a healthcare professional, be it a doctor or a, or a, or a, or a, or a nurse. And uh, uh, around 24% of patients in primary care have to wait for more than six days. This is the main reason, apart from other reasons, this is the main reason for people to avoid waiting lists to buy these uh, uh, private, uh, uh, private premiums. There is a strict control of the waiting lists. Uh, by the government. Uh, the ministry publishes every month the situation of the waiting lists in all the regions. And uh, nevertheless, politicians, in my opinion, uh, in general ten tend to give a small importance to, uh, to the waiting list, considering them rather a tool, uh, a, 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 a tool of political confrontation in the hands of the opposition than a real problem, as I think it is. Because, as you said, uh, accessibility is, is an important dimension of, of, of quality, obviously. Well, that's an excellent transition because the Spanish system has public plus private is 9.6% of the GDP. So obviously it's a very rationed, rationed system. 
So this has a considerable impact on accessibility and on quality. That's a good transition with the financing aspects. We're not going to talk about links between accessibility and financing. That's not the topic today, but I would like, however, to ask Madame Lividek the question. Lividek, and I think I can guess her answer. What indicators to measure quality, including for chronic pathologies and long uh, health care paths and for hospital and non-hospital paths, what indicators and what incentive can we have for performance? And that's linked to financial aspects. Yes, we can say two or three things because we do supply tools, measurement tools to measure this quality. First of all, indeed, we are in favor of there being incentives, including financial incentives. You get what you pay for. If In France, if we pay mainly for technical acts, you, that's what we will have mainly, technical acts. If we pay for the coordination of health care, we will have the coordination of health care. Secondly, these financing modes should not be orthogonal with octagonal. This is what creates a lot of unease in our public establishments because we're asking the teams to increase their activity to maintain their average. So on the one hand, we're in, in, encouraging them to be more relevant, and then we're saying, no, you have to do plus 2%. So we have to be careful here to the uh, orthogonal injunctions. Contradictory, shall we say. Yes, contradictory. So the financial incentives are important, but they're not alone. I think the first incentive for a healthcare professional is ethics. So I really believe in ethics of healthcare professionals. Secondly, I believe in transparency and reputation. I really believe that making these indicators public within certain conditions, of course, and we see that these are huge cultural changes. Practitioners have very good registers. If you ask a thoracic and a cardiac surgeon to give you the registers, they have them, but they don't want us or the patients to see them yet because they don't really know how it's going to be used. So we need to build something. And I think they may be right in that case. Yes, we have to reassure them. We need to use them intelligently. And this is why I said that we have to be very careful. Yes, we have to build up this confidence. And it is a question of management. You're right. And then finally, don't forget training. These are professionals, the initial training, the ongoing training, and recertification that we may be seeing more and more. This is an important tool as well for quality. So there's financing, but not only finances. How did the director general of the university hospital react to this question? Well, I agree with my colleague on the topic because I think you have to be very prudent and also very proactive. You need to change financing modes, and the state has now decided in France to do so, change the tarification mode, which is activity-based. But financing of our activity is 55% of our income only. But we need to continue to help the system evolve, and things are moving forward with the implementation of these new lump sum prices for chronic diseases, diabetes, etc. That's very good. And the state has also decided that there would be a financing of quality with 200 million this year. I think those are positive signs. But I also agree with what you were saying about the fact that uh, these indicators must be relevant and they must be really uh, accepted by the professionals. And the professionals need to feel that they, uh, that they are appropriate these indicators. We talked about decentralized and centralized approaches, and I think we'll have to find the right mix between the fact that you have to find local ways of uh, incentivizing the professionals. I had 10 million euros that I gave to my managers, and I gave them a certain number of objectives. So I think there are things that you can do on a local level to interest your teams concretely, and the teams will feel that they are real stakeholders and that they are building the indicators themselves and the quality objectives for the evolution of their uh, department and the institution. And obviously, there should be transversal gains for the entire establishment. But this element is very important, I think, as well. 
and it goes back to the information systems that I was mentioning earlier. And the question of confidence that you've just said is very, very fundamental. When we're talking about cardiac surgery registers, that's a good example. If you look at the mortality rate, for example, would it be opportune in this case to really put on the table and the national press can have access to it, the, the mortality rate, because if it's not explained properly, if it's not supported with elements of analysis to, to interpret the figures, it's very complex. And we know that if we communicate this to the media, well, it'll be on the market with or without you. Well, yes, but I think we need to work on the way we're going to communicate these indicators, especially when we go, when we're looking at medical result analyses and these will be problems of methodology and scientific methodology, and that's very complex. Yes, this echoes the previous roundtable. The more we educate patients upstream, the more they will understand. But patients, if you look at the analysis of the mortality rate of a department, I don't think that they will – they look at their own individual results. But I don't think from a methodology standpoint, the patients – you have to explain it to them. I'm not saying that we won't explain it to the patients. But an overall rate for a department, I don't think that means anything. If you look at each patient taken individual with respect to his pathology and his medical results, that's fundamental to be able to explain the reasons for a complication or a treatment that led to a long hospitalization or a problem. But both of them have to be well measured and analyzed upstream. But you can trust, uh, you can, this question, you said the same thing, the question of the right indicators. In France, it's true that we're always spending a lot of time trying to find the right indicators. Well, we have indicators, but I think it takes more time. I don't want to minimize what we're doing in France, but for the activity, in, as concerns the results and the experience, we're very far, far from a result. And when you say the press is already doing it, they, they take the mortality rate without adjusting it, and they just publish it in the press. I think it would be better to really supervise this communication with adjusted indicators and control it linked to the severity of the treatment and the best establishments have the highest mortality rates. Uh, that, that can be explained. I think this indicator story, we could be more relaxed and more communicative, I think. I think the problem is more a question of confidence because I am, I agree, I agree with this question of saying that the indicators must come from the healthcare professionals. We need to listen to them with the patients and integrate this. But at the same time, we need a certain – people need to buy into this. So there's a real link that needs to be created. So yes, the quality of these indicators is so important for them to make sense in terms of improving quality. So yes, improving the quality, we need to improve the databases and the information systems that we use because patient files need to communicate. And we need to go slowly. A culture of quality isn't a political thing. It's a real cultural change. Well, that will be the last words in just a few minutes each. We haven't totally handled the question of governance. We've gone around it, but each one of you could you tell me what you think it's important to do to make progress on certain questions of governance, confidence, and management? Who would like to start? I didn't understand your question. You're talking about the governance of the system or the governance of the teams who are producing the health care? Well, both, but the teams, yes. Well, I really think it's indeed this tension that we've described this morning between what should be national, the incentive measures on the national level, and then all of the local initiatives where people really buy into this and they, they build local uh, uh, indicators that they will be using. Well, confidence, I think, is very important among the teams and co-construction with the teams of these indicators and co-construction with the patients. I don't separate the patients from the teams. On the contrary, we already... Uh, assess patient satisfaction, but we need to go further in the question of methodology and information systems to produce these indicators, and we really want the actors to take ownership of it if we want to succeed. So you are committing to this? Okay. So what is an economist's vision of this? Tell us a bit more. 
Well, as an economist, I'm the only economist around the table, but align these quality incentives with your economic incentives. You can't wait for the teams to do things right if they're losing money or if it's not appreciated by the management because they've reduced uh, the tariffs. So it's extremely important to identify best practices, what is the right indicator. And then the financing will often will come at the end. You try to support a best practice, a best quality practice with intelligence, not by giving indicators from top down and then the financing that goes with it without really listening to what it will solve in the establishment and in the professional's daily practice. Ignacio, what did you dream about during the round table that you would love to take home to Spain with you tomorrow? During this round table? Uh, I was very interested in the, what the German person said about a group of standards at a federal level. I, I think this is important for the system, for the entire system. Merci, uh,